people don't like us because we skate and they have to go to work. That was Giovanni Retta, a 25-year-old writer and photographer for skateboarding magazines when interviewed in 1999. Like most other skateboards in New York City during the 1990s, Mr. Retta reacted passionately after the general public and municipal governments escalated tensions with skaters through bans and the invention of the skate stopper. People who did not yet understand the activity viewed skateboarding as a nuisance that came with noise, liability, and property damage. As a result, townships outlawed the activity and demonized skateboarding as a crime. But beginning in 1990, courts found that the system of using local police to disperse skateboarders, confiscate boards, and impose fines was unconstitutional. This video seeks to understand the prohibition of skateboarding in urban space beyond the simple history of skaters versus haters. This video will first look at radical skaters, after that reactionary haters, then municipal skateboarding bans, questions of constitutionality, the invention of the skate stoppers, skateboarders liberation of public space, and a conclusion. Sit back, relax, and if you like what you see, please consider subscribing. This battle over who gets to use urban space came at a time when adults excluded adolescents from public spaces. Patsy E. Owens, a professor of landscape architecture, argued that municipal ordinances against skateboarding, loitering, and staying out past curfew were a result of adults' poor perceptions of teenagers. These ordinances reflected a greater movement away from public space. Quote, no longer are they settings for spontaneous social meetings. These activities now take place at coffee shops, supermarkets, and health clubs. Public spaces are instead designed to support specific activities such as transportation. Teenagers, however, still want to and need to use public spaces as social gathering places." End quote. Skateboarding provides teens with a non-transactional way to enjoy public space, but the greater trend of excluding teens from public space resulted in skateboarding bans and the eventual creation of the Skate Stopper. Skateboarding was first popularized on the Californian coast during the 1950s, but the sport took off with the advent of skating pools in the 1970s. As the skateboarding industry grew, the activity spread to the East Coast and New York City in the 1980s and grew exponentially in the 1990s. The most significant development for New York City skateboarding was the development of street skating. Street skating predates and takes place outside of skate parks. The habits of street skating inform the design of skate parks. For skaters utilize obstacles designed to mimic stairs, handrails, ledges, and curbs. Urban historians are familiar with the skater versus hater dynamic. Dr. Ocean Howell, skateboarder and professor of urban history, formalizes the language of this relationship by calling skateboarders the creative class and the gentrifying city. Howell cited urban planning professor Richard Florida to argue that supporting the urban creative class, which includes skateboarders, will stimulate urban growth because an organic street culture attracts employers. The haters sent an understandable and seemingly reasonable message. Skateboarding outside of a controlled skate park is risky, noisy, and potentially damaging to public property. The haters were not only able to temporarily bring law enforcement on their side, but they also bought into the invention of the skate stopper as a means to prevent skateboarding on both public and private properties. The ban started with the complaints, the earliest coming from the medical establishment. The British Medical Journal published several short letters on skateboard injuries. Dr. J.R. Oakley from Sheffield's Children's Hospital in 1978 
rode against elbow and knee pads' abilities to defend against injuries. Oakley's real concern was less for the skateboarders who are aware that they might injure themselves, noting that they seem to have scant regard for fellow users of pedestrian byways. He hoped that future studies would investigate how skateboards injure other pedestrians, particularly young children and the elderly. In the eyes of the haters, the skaters signed up to risk injury, so they mainly acted as a hazard to others. Professionals declared that banning skateboarding was in the public interest and a common good for the health and safety of the municipality. In April of 1987, the town of Islip on Long Island banned sidewalk skating in business areas. The town ordinance urged skateboarders to dress in reflective gear at night, and the town gave $25 fines to skateboarders frisked by police. Similar bans swept the nation and police arrested, frisked, and handcuffed three teenagers for skateboarding on the sidewalk in an elite seaside community of Palm Beach, Florida. According to a New York Times article, charges were not filed, but the police still arrested three teenagers for playing outside with a wooden rolling toy on public property. Again, the police arrested teenagers across the nation for playing with a toy outdoors. One of the more extreme skateboarding bans took place in 1992 in Elmsford, a village of Westchester County, New York. Analyzing Lynn Ames' article for the New York Times reveals how Elmsford took the side of drivers over pedestrians. Quote, The mayor said that brakes screech, startled drivers, and pedestrians cursed, and the young people cursed back. One boy told me, well, I can't say for print what he told me. When I told him what he was doing is dangerous. Mr. Mayor DeAngelis said. The police confiscated skateboards and threatened to fine children and their parents up to $500, roughly $1,000 adjusted for inflation. 12-year-old James Carrera Jr. had to bring his parents to police headquarters to pick up his confiscated toy. The village of Elmsford banned not only skateboarding but also rollerblading and skating. These actions made skaters and lawyers question the ban's constitutionality. The following year, 1993, skaters utilized the Fifth Amendment guarantee that the government cannot seize private property without making a due compensation at the market value of the property. In the law case People v. Smith, where the village of Red Hook's courts deemed local skateboarding ban unconstitutional, the police would no longer be able to enact 30-day confiscation of skateboards nor could they slap on $25 fines. People v. Smith was a major win for the skaters because it set legal precedent against unconstitutional skateboarding ordinances. Nonetheless, the haters were a crafty bunch of professionals, for they realized that when the law did not work, technology would. A patent for a walkway abuse deterrent system filed in 1998 is early evidence of the invention of skate stoppers and skate deterrents. This small injection molded skate stopper uses epoxy to adhere to the shape of a curb, ledge, or handrail by bending in the middle and gripping onto the epoxy with holes embedded in the bottom. This invention was a physical reaction to the rise of street skateboarding. The patent reasoning that not all skateboarders and inline skaters practice their sport in ways that are respectful of people or property, in the words of Lowry, the patenter. This architectural invention is hostile against any uses of public space that are contrary to what is intended. Not only private entities, but also public ones employ the skate stopper. Deterrents are an effective system of stopping skateboarding because they quite literally interrupt public space and sight lines. Skateboarders liberate public space when they remove skate stoppers from their town or city. The radical and oftentimes illegal act of denobbing skate spots is not uncommon in the skateboarding subculture. There's a subculture of DIYers in skateboarding, generally composed of blue-collar people who do handiwork 
or white collar workers with access to time and disposable income. Denobbing a skate spot is more radical and subversive than the construction of a DIY skate spot because it is a response to the haters' backlash. A 2003 San Diego Union Tribune article by Connor Doherty recorded this battle between skaters and the ultimate hater. Skateboarders named Chris Lowry, the aforementioned inventor of skate stoppers, the enemy of skateboarding, in the words of former Trans World Skateboarding editor Dave Swift. Many skaters gave Lowry honest feedback. One John hand wrote, Your product seems to work well, other than the fact that it completely sucks. Skateboarders also sent death threats to Chris Lowry. They tried to assault him. And the FBI once had to track down a 14-year-old who threatened to bomb his company. By 2003, an estimated 400,000 skate stoppers interrupted ledges around America. Lowry claimed that he never meant to be a major buzzkill. Instead, it was apparently the free market that urged him to be a killjoy. Quote, I don't wake up every day with the intention of ruining some kid's afternoon. If we weren't doing this, somebody else would. Lowry continued to improve his product, and the original plastic patent transformed into a more expensive and profitable metal skate stopper that utilized custom-made screws to embed into wet concrete. Skateboarders soon discovered that it was quite easy to remove skate stoppers. Initially, a hammer did the trick, but that method was fruitless against the improved metal skate stoppers. A 2009 YouTube video by Skaters for Public Skate Parks documented skaters' removal of skate stoppers at a public skate park. Supplied with blow torches, crowbars, and sledgehammers, the skateboarders removed the skate stoppers one at a time. A police officer approached the skateboarders and ordered the skateboarders to stop and get on the ground. <laughs> but the skateboarders procured a Theus Park right of entry from Metro Park. Uh, this is the uh, Theus Park right of entry from Metro Parks basically says that we are allowed to uh, conduct the removal of all of the skate stoppers at this spot. So they continued as permitted. In sum and substance, the haters discover that the solution to curb skateboarding and the youth that come with it away from public space was not to ban the practice, but to interrupt the surfaces that are target for sliding, as indicated in the skate stop pattern. When courts deemed skateboarding bans unconstitutional, cities had to find legal means to deter skateboarders. The broader effect of skate stoppers adds to the culmination of city planning that seeks to remove adolescents from public space. Skateboarders, of course, responded radically to this process to liberate public space, destroying skate stoppers through legal or illegal means. Skateboarders are crafty, so if they have not won already, they will win soon. In the words of Philadelphian architect and planner Edmund Bacon, 1910 to 2005, I think sometimes <clears throat> that skateboarders are even a little bit too uh, modest about themselves. And I think that they must realize that they are at the cutting edge of a new perception of life for the young. And that in the long run, they're absolutely bound to win because uh, that's the way history works, that there are a bunch of jerks that can't see the new vision at all, and it scares them. Skateboarders redefined the relationship of its youth practitioners to urban space. Once a skateboarder, or anyone else for that matter, develops the eye to imagine tricks where others see a parking block, only skate stoppers can deter them. Barely. <laughs>